in this week's episode of Weaponized. One of the shapes that he said it was commonly reported is a jellyfish shape. We were told that and thinking, wow, that would be great footage to have. And then something came our way. We thought it might be a balloon. It's moving kind of like yeah. a balloon. But a balloon that you can't lock on? Catch the final two episodes of season one of Weaponized. I just want to share what I saw. I think the first interview that most people saw was conducted by the New York Post. W were they trying to get you just to debunk it right out the gate? I think they wanted me to. Let's play the second video. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever gonna get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. This is Weaponized. I'm George Knapp, as always, with my compadre, Jeremy Corbell. Quite a week in UFO world. The great smudge versus bird poop debate raged. An iconic UFO shape and video entered the modern lexicon. Uh, members of Congress heard some startling testimony from Inspector General uh, related to the allegations made by David Grush. And oh, the folks behind TMZ uncorked a stellar, groundbreaking series that's already been seen all over the world. This will be a bit of an odd episode, Jeremy, bifurcated, sort of a hybrid, because we're including chunks of an episode that we originally recorded months ago, but did not unleash. Can you tell our listeners why? Yeah, man, George, it's because what, what you told me from the very beginning, it, it is our, our duty to protect sources, even if they don't protect themselves. And we also wanted to kind of smoke out people and see who would come forward and are they going to try to do disinfo or real information? So we, we were kind of like not giving every detail, not because we didn't want to, but because that's how we know if somebody was actually there. So these specifics that we have, we held back in this part people are going to hear and see soon. It was just like, we were like surface level. Here's what happened. And then let's see who comes forward. And holy shit. I mean, we had a number of sources before. But now people are coming out of the woodwork, even publicly. So that's what people are going to hear in just a minute is kind of like what we recorded when we were just starting to lay the pipe, you know? Yeah. So we'll get into sort of the birth of the jellyfish story, the jellyfish video, give some indications how it came into our possession and, and what steps we were taking to try to verify that it was a real deal. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about this, of course. Uh, but it started, the world got to see it first on this Harvey Levin production. You know, of course, people bitched and moaned about Harvey. Oh, my God, TMZ, it's going to be on Tubi. This is terrible. I, I don't know if they think that we should only unveil UFO videos or cases on Masterpiece Theater or something on PBS <laughs> or, you know, it, it can only happen in some some other um, platform. But Harvey is interested in this topic. He does good work. He's, you know, expressed his interest and in how much he knows about it before to us. And yeah. he has this amazing production machine at his disposal. So I, I was pretty impressed by the series. Yeah. You know, look, uh, me too. You know, it was crazy because um, being the subject, you know, as we often are in these things, like, I don't know what the final thing is going to be like it, precisely, but I, I'll, I'll say this. Yeah. People were like, oh, UFOs on TMZ. That's a bad thing. Dude. We need to engage popular culture. We need to engage the average person just watching television. Like I like to say, if my mom is like, you know, hey, that's interesting, then wow, we've really reached a wide variety. Uh, TMZ really has earned my trust. And let, let me throw down here for a second. Like, out of everybody that I've ever worked with on, on, a, on a production, the only person that has ever meant what they said and did what they said they would was was actually Harvey Levin. He'll tell you if you ever, if we ever get him on this show, he'll tell you I was so skeptical of him. I was I've put him on his fucking heels. I told him he had to earn my trust. And when we did that first series, George, where we're releasing government filmed footage of officially designated UAP confirmed by the Pentagon, man, he earned my trust. So when he called me and said, "Hey, man, let's go deep." Let's do a deep one. 
I was like, okay, let's do it because I, I inherently trusted him. So the TMZ production and, and, and the crew, I just have to say shout out to Gustavo, shout out to Ryan. I mean, these guys just really went for it and did such a good job. I was actually, I saw the series now. I was catching up like everybody else. I finally got to see what they wove together. And uh, man, it's a fun series. It's informative. The fact you and I decided to release it using this. Now, let me explain that. Uh, you know it, George, but let me explain it to, to the audience here. This is, this is perilous, man. Our job is to protect sources even if they don't protect themselves. Getting shit out in a big way real quick, it, it helps eliminate some of the threat. Like, let's get it out there. I was grateful to work with them. And by the way, look, TMZ, it's owned by, by Fox. Fox is connected to Tubi. It, it's the way that the world works to get information out. Look at the product. Look at the final product. And I was really, although uncomfortable, I, I you know, seeing it, I, I was really happy with it, man. It has been nothing to see here, move on. All of that has changed. Here was a phenomenon that the government couldn't protect us from. What's really going on with the UFO situation? What was the most impressive thing to you about this video, which the world has not seen yet? It has everyone asking questions. More and more witnesses are coming forward. There are many who believe that the government is hiding the truth of this. Are we alone in the universe? No, they're coming here. Yeah, I thought it looked pretty good. And, uh, you know, uh, you can't wait for 60 minutes to do UFO shows um, because, you know, it, it could be, uh, you know, years in between when they might cover something. We're glad that they originally had some kind of an interest in it, but you can't wait on mainstream media. They're, they're still ignoring it. So uh, a popular platform and a popular producer like Hat Harvey is, is where you go. I mean, you want to reach a vast audience. We're not tailoring this content to UFO world. It's supposed to be humanity that should be an interested yes. in this stuff. Totally, man. And like, so, so I really don't care. I mean, you know, George, it's not just like lip service, like, I don't fucking read that shit. I don't get involved with that nonsense when it comes to like the online trolls and shit. If I learn something, somebody will, will send me a direct link and, and I'll click it. Um, for me, I'm singularly focused. Let's get the information out and let's try to find out what it is. Is it prosaic? Is it not prosaic? We're just reporting what we know and getting it out in a big way. It, it was a really good experience, and and I think it was right for this particular series uh, of UFOs that we exposed to the world. So yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I know that as we do this, uh, it can be abrasive to people. Like th we're doing the best we can. That's the best we can do. And I'm really happy with the series, man. I, I, it was fun. So the jellyfish made its debut. Long last. You know, we've had yeah. this for a while, yes. and been trying to work on it and trying to go about it in a way that both uh, protects the the uh, the original sources, multiple sources, but also to, you know, engage with people who know what they're talking about, who can tell us what the hell this thing was. Um, we recorded an episode of this podcast a couple of months ago, and we weren't exactly sure when we'd be able to uncork it. There were some steps that had to happen before we could release it to the world. It's now out there and everyone's debating the legitimacy, what it really shows, but I wanted to share with our audience what we recorded months ago, sort of as a step-by-step a -step process in how this information was obtained and verified and uh, what steps we've taken since. Let's do it. Let's play it. Let's go. The following is an unreleased episode of Weaponized recorded in 2023, featuring both videos of the Jellyfish UAP and our detailed analysis at the time. This is Weaponized. Today, we're going to talk about UFOs of all shapes and sizes. You know, you've been to my house, Jeremy. You've seen my library, all these books about UFOs, thousands of them. Yeah. And you look at, uh, you know, you look at the history of the UFO phenomenon. Why are there so many different kinds? You know, if it's one extraterrestrial or interdimensional intelligence, why do they have so many models? It's like they got the Fords, the Chryslers, the GMs, the AMCs, the Nissans. Uh, you know, some are orbs. Some are flying saucers, some are discs, some are, are cigar-shaped, some are red, white, blue, multicolored, different uh, sizes and shapes of all kinds. Some of them we've seen over the years, people wonder, are there living beings? That movie, nope. You've seen that movie, right? Right, 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 right. yeah. yeah. We, we, why do they come in the variety pack? That's what Bob Lazar, that was his word for it. 
He said there were nine flying saucers at S4, and they're all different. The sport model, the jello mold, the top hat. Why so many different kinds? Yeah, e even Dr. Lekatsky on one of the episodes of Weaponized was commenting on that, that the reports that were coming about U UAP or UFOs, obviously a lot of them are spheres. That's very common. You also have like the tic-tac shape, very commonly reported. You have the triangle or uh, you could say pyramid three-dimensionally by angle of observation, triangular UAP or UFOs. So you and I get a lot of these reports of very odd shapes. They, they don't make sense. They're not aerodynamic. Some some are huge craft that look like Toblerone chocolates, you know? I mean, yeah, really, we, and we don't always know what to do with them. I mean, they come from the general public. I get five or 10 a day. I don't know what to do with them. I'm an image analyst. I don't, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. You get the same thing, I'm sure, every day, right? Yeah, yeah. And some from military guys. For sure. So, you know, oftentimes anonymously, that kind of thing with, with subtext, like, here's an image, here's something we captured, but here's the story behind it. You know, I don't want you to know me. I don't want to be known. Like, I get that. But they're really hard usually to track down and get information on. Uh, but, but we, luckily, we have an ability, a pretty unique ability, to be able to get in there and validate when things have been well documented, if it's a military case. We share it with people who are in a position to know, who've seen this kind of stuff, who do this kind of analysis for a living, for our government. Right, and so very strangely, there's this one shape that kind of has, has entered our realm of understanding, but I was reading that old book by uh, Ruppelt was his name, who's part of Project Edward Blue Book. Ruppelt, yeah. Right, and in there he was describing the different shapes, and. One of the shapes that he said it was pretty wild that is a is commonly reported is a jellyfish shape. Uh, I had never really heard about that shape when it came to UAP or UFO until a couple cases came into us, which we haven't reported on. And it was it was pretty wild to hear these descriptions. Let, let's give an example of one of the first time I heard about now you you know there's some historic versions of jellyfish shape. You, you told me about one sure. in Russia? Yeah, a, a lot of times uh, people will have uh, report jellyfish UFOs, jellyfish shapes in the sky because of rocket launches. Uh, there was a case in Russia, it's a famous case, Petrozavodsk, gigantic jellyfish looking thing after a rocket launch. Officially, the Russian Ministry of Defense said, oh yeah, that's, that's because of this rocket. Unofficially, that incident, Petrozavodsk, is why they started a nationwide 10 year long secret UFO study because it wasn't exactly what was reported to the public. But I mean, whenever there's a launch in Vandenberg, a SpaceX goes up, people in Nevada see that, see that in the sky, and it looks like a jellyfish in, in the interim af after a, a rocket launch. Uh, so I'm used to the idea, like my mind is used to the idea, you say UFO, I'm thinking, okay, there, it's a ball of light, it's a, it's a disc like Bob Lazar described. But even he said there were some weird models at, at Site 4 one looked like a, you said a jelly mold. Is that what you said? Yeah, the jello, jello, jello mold. mold. Jello mold. Yeah. So, so that th this idea, I had to change my opinion. It was very uncomfortable when people would report things to me, like military people, that something looked bizarre. It was almost like they were embarrassed to say what it looked like. But look, I, I grabbed this. This is a 1977 comic called UFO and Outer Space. Are they alive? And I see if the audience can see this on the front camera. This is like. Here, I'll put it like that. This is like a whole bunch of jellyfish style UFOs, you know, inv invading a military base. And this was from 1977. So this has been in the zeitgeist for a while. One of the weirdest things that, I, that I've heard, and we, we talked about this interview, was from a, from a secure, I'll say, uh, a nuclear facility. I mean, I, should, Pantex. Pantex. Okay, Pantex. So at Pantex, where they work on nuclear weapons. Okay, they tell me together. about that. Pantex is where they take them apart and put them together. They got a lot of plutonium. It's a highly secure, classified facility. Security is very tight there. It's not a place that you would expect to get UFO reports or UFO incursions. But we've been hearing about this for a while. A very distinct uh, description of what floated through Pantex. Take it away. Yeah, so this is, you know, between two areas that are like silos and there's, you know, a lot of plutonium and radioactive material, you could see there's like a, a corridor with uh, kind of guard stations, right? And what was described to us 
was an object and it was, by the way, it was filmed both on night vision and thermal. It's not something we have, nor ethically would it be something we'd able ever, you know, to put out into the world. Uh, you know, it would be a great day. One day we have transparency on this stuff, but what traversed down this channel between two different areas where storage locations, a lot of, you know, plutonium storage and that kind of thing was best described as a domed structure about eight to 10 feet in, you know, in width, you know, a little taller at the top, like a dome with what was described directly to us as like tentacles or, or dendrites. I don't even know what that is, like tentacles that came down. I mean, it sounds wild. And the thing goes through this area at a contr with controlled flight, it goes through it. It ends at the end of that kind of channel, goes up and shoots off at a 45 degree direction. So this is what's described to us. And apparently somewhere there's footage of this kind of thing. First time I ever heard of it. Yeah, we were told that and thinking, wow, that would be great footage to have. And then something came our way. It, it, we've been looking forward to this day for a long time yeah. where we could share this with the public, but we had to go through some procedures before it was safe to do it. Um, this is the creepiest UFO video I've ever seen. Yeah, it, it is an unidentified, we don't know what it is, but the reaction on base is what we're gonna talk about. But I think, let's just look at this. We call it the jellyfish UFO because I don't have a better terminology for it, but it it is very similar in shape to kind of what was reported to us that, that happened at a nuclear facility. So here we are, I'll say it's a 2018, we can say it's, at a military installation in the Middle East. Should I identify a little bit more? Let's show the video. Okay. I, for those who are listening to the, the audio podcast, you really need to see this video. Oh, you got to go yeah, watch Yeah, you got to go watch yeah. this video. We're just going to play it without any commentary, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Super, Let's just play it. Super bizarre. Let's play it. This was a head scratcher for me, right? And, and the reason why I think it's valuable enough to show is because this object was identified as UAP. It was classified as UAP, but the events that occurred, it, you know, from, from how we understand it, the events that occurred is that immediately, so this is a base where there's multiple countries involved. The feeds were shut off to the other countries. So it was just U.S. personnel. So what's recording this is the question. Okay. Uh, how, what, what is the system that is recording this uh, object? Because 
and you had indicated to me they had trouble tracking it, right? Yeah, they had trouble locking onto it. Target it, right? right. So that, that that was the issue. So first of all, the, the system. So let's just say it this way: there is with these bases, you need to protect the perimeter of these bases. So there is an optical system, an optical platform that's dedicated. This this platform can go. You know, it can lock an Al Qaeda tire at 27 miles and call in a strike on that vehicle. It has precision locking. It's, as you can see, it's high quality thermal imagery. It's black and white because it's showing heat. So this system is, let's say above the base and it is tasked with targeting and locking potential threats. The problem is operators couldn't get a lock on this object. They don't know if it was active jamming, if it was not, you know, but it should be able, no problem to target. It's the first time people haven't been able to use these systems to actually lock. I know when we first talked about this thing, when we first were watching it uh, a couple of years ago, it, it was clear that we thought it might be a balloon. It's moving kind of like yeah. a balloon, but a balloon that you can't lock on, that, a, that the, the best system in our military is unable to get a lock on it. That's uh, quite a balloon. Yeah, so so that was uh, initially when, when I was looking at it, I was thinking, okay, is it floating trash? Is it some sort of, um, you know, clump of balloons? And they, they take it very seriously because this is a base incursion. This is something of unknown origin that's coming through the base. The thing is, if you look at it, it's a very bizarre thing. I'm, I'll tell you what people that really got, th this footage that, that we don't have, there's really close up of it. What was described to me was that these things you see hanging down, that they were geometric as if like it was specifically said to me, like an armor or like a fish scales. So when, when geometric pieces there, and you notice also it's stiff, right? So there's not a lot of wind from what I understand at the base at the time. It's, it's literally moving under intelligent control. The, the, the question or the thing, the fear was that it's some sort of intelligence a reconnaissance platform. You know how we had the Chinese balloon and it was collecting yeah. intelligence. So it's at a very secure location. And the worry is either does it have a payload and it's going to blow some shit up or Why? is it collecting intelligence? Why is it changing colors? Now this right. is at nighttime, right? This right. is a nighttime, a thermal system that's right. recording it. So it goes from white to dark. Yep. It's changing temperatures. We don't know what is causing this thing to go hot, cold, hot, cold. So somebody tracked this all the way through that base. It goes all the way through this base. Yeah, the footage uh, goes all the way through the base. In fact, the, the, what we got, the information we got with it is that they were tasked with, uh, or whoever was operating this was tasked to go like 35 minutes. They, they kept following it and just slewing as they went. So, so that was that was fascinating to begin with. I mean, what is this? Just it's weird. Looking. It's creepy. It's a. It looks like it could be a living thing, like a living being, doesn't it? It could the, like I, it would be a jellyfish. I, a jellyfish. A new a new species. <laughs> you saw it first on Weaponized. Um, I don't know, but the military classifies UAP. But let me tell you a little bit more about what went down at the base. I mean, we we have been able to to really find out a lot more about what went down that day. Here's what we what we heard and what we know to be true at this point, which is that the moment this thing is identified, it was like all hands on deck, shut off feeds to other countries. There were two other countries at the base at the time. Operating. So normally a feed would go to a couple of our allies who were sure. also at this base. Right. And they cut that off. They cut that off. So that was the first thing that was dramatically different than anything before, you know, at this base. Um, next thing was that people that are in this command center, you know, they're seeing this feed and they're, they're told to go out and look with night vision. And how, it, how I understand it is they could not see it with uh, the NVG's night vision goggles, they could not see it. So it has a thermal signature, but from the reports, it doesn't have like an infrared signature, like a light signature, which is weird. You think something thermally is going hot and cold, you're gonna have some light associated with it, but you can see nobody's aware of this on the ground. So that, that's a head scratcher. Yeah, it's floating above people. Nobody's looking up and pointing at it. They don't see it. No, and at the, and dogs fact, don't see it either. And and things were really weird on the base at that time. What happened was, for people, there was high alert. People go in, and they I'll just say they they take the footage. They take the footage. They don't do the normal process with the footage. From how I understand it, they take it. So there's multiple places at this base where people are able to watch this on a screen. They know it's a uh, it's happening. One central place that this footage link goes up to with a bunch of people in there. And they cut that off to make sure other people didn't see it. Other nations outside. Yeah. And then someone goes to 
the sort of the skiff? Is it a skiff or do we know? Um, yeah, this would be filmed in a secure location. So somebody goes to that skiff and says, we're grabbing it. That's, they grabbed the original. That's the word on the wash. There's no, there's no checkout of, of the stuff. There's just go, they go up, they take it. I, I think everybody had to sign NDAs saying, I'm not going to talk about this, which is also weird. If it's just like trash in a balloon or something normal. So it was, it was, ident it was identified. It was classified as a UAP. Now, the other weird thing- Is what happens next. Well, even before that, what, what happens is everybody gets asked about it. So everybody gets, I don't know, debriefed. They go and they, they have to say, did you see anything? I mean, it was, it was like this big thing that happened. It wasn't just like an isolated little thing. They went and they questioned a bunch of people. What did you see? Describe what right. you saw. No, you didn't see it. That's right. You're not allowed to talk about it. I, I do believe people had to sign NDAs, right? So if that was it, I'd be like, cool video, eerie, weird. What do you do with what it? What do you do? We don't know. But here's where it gets weird. And, and also, I, I got to say, this is the curse of the UFO field. Like, we don't have what I'm about to describe, right? I, I imagine, I mean, I know that footage exists somewhere where they go close up on it. Here's what it did next. It travels throughout the base. And, there, and, and people are told, you know, keep tracking it, follow it. You know, it's an object of interest. It goes out over a large body of water. And from how I understand it, how it was reported to us, is that it's trucking along this body of water and it stops on a dime, just stops abrupt. And it descends into the water. And I was asking, okay, so these things hanging down, does it like fall and float down into it like stiff? It goes down into that water. So people are tasked with like observing the area. What's going to go on now? Because they can tell it's controlled flight. This is not just something floating with the wind. Right? So after it goes in the water, they continue watching. Right. Because it's not like bobbing and weaving and floating with the wind. This thing was directly going through this highly sensitive area. It goes out over this body of water. It descends down into that water. Everybody's watching this area for about 15 minutes. They're just making sure like what happened? Is there anything going on? This thing comes back out from the water slowly. And again, stiff, and it's not changing thermal signature. And then from how it's described, boom, shoots off at 45 degrees, very much like what happened at Pantex, where it kind of does this reconnaissance job and then shoots off. But I mean, again, I don't know who's <laughs> documenting this and like, obviously, um, they didn't document the whole thing, uh, you know, with how we're seeing it. So this is the same object. Let's play the second video. So weird, right? Very strange. I mean, it's it's creepy. It's a creepy video. I, I remember the first couple of times we watched it, it, uh, it stays with you and it stays in your head. I guess the question is, what was done with this information? We're in the age of transparency, UFO transparency. Did it go higher ups? Did it go to Arrow? Did it go to Congress? Who saw it? Well, 
it was it was buried by an agency, and I can say that much. So, uh, an intelligence agency. Yeah, it was buried by an agency, and and we we have actually shown this to some government officials so that they could go try to get more information on this people that would have ability and access because the full footage of this thing now it is traversing over the water, goes into the water, comes up, shoots off. I mean, that is powerful footage. Do you, do you want to even admit kind of some of what, we, what we've what we been told or who, you, who we showed to? Well, we showed it to people who investigated UAP, UFO videos and cases for a living. They did it for our government. For our government. They were good at it. Yeah. And uh, we showed it to them a while back and they don't know what the hell this is. Right. They do not know. They've right. never seen anything quite like it. Right. So, yeah. So the object, like, obviously I wish, you know, we, we, you know, we're kind of get lucky sometimes, but with the UFO curse, it's like, we don't have, what I would like to see is I would like to see that abrupt stop. That, uh, there's no reason for me to question the information we have verified from numerous people. This event happened exactly like we're describing, but that proof, that evidence is with an intelligence agency of this object stopping, going into the water for a duration of period, coming back out and shooting off. Again, like the Pantex footage, that it that is that is somewhere in the world. I mean that 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 footage exists. The full footage of this also exists. Now, I love this case. It's very weird. Jellyfish UFOs, what's next, man? I mean, that's pretty wild. But like whatever this is, I, I would like to I would like to know people's opinions. I would like, you know, more experts than just the ones that we know to say what is, you know, what is it they're seeing. But I'll tell you the base. So took this so seriously. It was handled differently than any other incursion or anything that they've had. And, and people do send bombs over fences, but the fact this thing was on a controlled flight along through the sensitive area slowly, and then goes out over the water, starts trucking. The, the, the question is, what was it doing? Was it, was it reconnaissance or some kind of surveillance operation? It seems like gathering yeah. information, you know, um, I don't know, you, you try to stay off social media, so you may not have seen this, but yeah. we've been admonished in recent times. We should not be releasing UAP, UFO imagery of any kind, footage, photos, not until the government and or some other entity has done a full investigation. You and I are irresponsible for sharing these kind of images with the public. Um, one guy, Rich Hoffman from SCU, um, who said that he equates us with Jaime Musan, the guy with the alien mummies, which which broke my heart because now we've got our own alien mummies. We're going to take them to SCU. What are we going to do with them now? Um, but, you know, in Rich's estimation, we need to share this with the government and not put this stuff out to the public. We are not making a claim that this is alien craft. Yeah. The same with the USS Omaha, the Sphere, the, the pyramids. We don't know what those things are. We just know that they were investigated by our government. And our government classified them as UAP. Yeah. We think that this is going to be classified as UAP as well. But the fact is that that footage, whoever has it, has sat on it and hasn't shared it. But we know it's classified as UAP. That's the thing that's yeah. part of why we're bringing it out. Is that the, so, so even the mechanisms within our government to study this doesn't have this. And, that, and that's, that's a problem. The, the core and the raw footage exists. I mean, we can tell people exactly who would be holding on to this. But I think the idea is, look, it's really weird looking. But it is, it was classified UAP and the way that uh, it's, it was handled was so severe. I think that that's what's, you know, important here is that we, we are, we are trying, I didn't know people were so pissed at uh, social media. Oh, yeah, in general, like, yeah, they're always no, we, pissed at We have to, time. we have to put stuff out that we know to be accurate, that this is an example of UAP, as weird as it looks, as weird as it looks. Look, I don't know what Arrow's putting out. They're putting out known cases half the time. This is an unknown. And this was handled with high uh, sensitivity. This is for whether you like it or not. This is this is UAP. This is an unidentified in a sensitive area, an incursion of a base. No matter how weird it looks, we have to report that news. It was designated UAP. So, well, I was surprised by Rich Hoffman's remarks because I've interviewed him four or five times. Yeah, and uh, to find that he finds us so distasteful for releasing images that we've done, I guess he had to hold his nose when he did these image these interviews with us when we were promoting SCU. SCU's conference, SCU's papers on radio, television, podcasts, things of that sort. Apparently, he had to suck it up even to be in the same room with us uh, because we're so disreputable. But hopefully, he'll give us some input about this uh, UFO if it's not too distasteful for him to analyze it. 
Oh, you know, look, man, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, the, the slings and arrows, like they, they come at when you're trying to report on this stuff. If we obtain footage and we think it has value, we know it was classified UAP by our military. It, it is our duty as journalists to put that out and show people uh, no, no matter what it is, it's, it's time for us to do that. Yeah, we also like to get input from our listeners, from right. people who watch us or listen to us on the podcast. Right. Uh, a lot of folks out there who have a lot more expertise than we do in analyzing these kinds of images and will give us feedback on it. And that's yeah. what we're hoping happens with this one. There's got to be other people in our audience who have seen this, either this video or something like it, maybe the Pantax video, uh -huh. and maybe somebody will come forward and share more information with us. Yeah, and th by the way, there's also um, a whole incursion situation that happened over a nuclear facility in France that that I personally know that I remember. there's We've talked about footage yeah. of. Yeah, um, and, and I do hope that that can get out to the public so we can get more information. But um, look, man, it's just a really weird shaped one. And if I didn't have that background of that exactly being described to us with the, that Pantex case and, and other nuclear facilities. Like this is a shape that occurs throughout history. If that's what they're talking about, it is really weird looking. I don't know what that is. If people go and Google UFO jellyfish, they'll yeah. find other cases. Most of them are rocket launches that look like a jellyfish in the sky, the exhaust, but there are at least a few other UFO jellyfish cases in the annals of history that, that are worth taking a look at. So Yeah, in our, in our past episode, we talked about the Syria UAP, and it was like a domed thing. That looked more structural. You know, it did seem to have something coming down the bottom, but I call that more like a domed UAP. Um, this one, for lack of a better term, because this is the way it's described to us, is jellyfish in shape. It's weird. It's man. very weird. So yeah. anybody out there, you got some ideas about what this thing might be? Or if you've got other images of similar kinds of incidents, send it our way. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, hopefully we'll learn more. Okay, so that is the episode we recorded a while back. Now the world has seen jellyfish and has debated it. And of course, so much of the reaction is absolutely predictable. Same people saying the same stuff. It's a smudge on the lens, which is preposterous. I mean, you know, it's preposterous on so many levels. It's bird poop, equally preposterous. Um, it's balloons. Now, we consider balloons, right? When we first saw yes. them, maybe it's balloons. Why isn't it balloons? What do you think? Yeah, so look, uh, we, so just to be clear, we, we, we don't know what this is. Neither does our government. They labeled it UAP unknown. That, so so we, we don't know. They don't know. We're looking for answers. Everybody's looking for answers. Every source we have, every person that we know that was there that's seen the footage, everybody's looking for answers. So, so that's what we're really doing here. I do want to make a correction, and I, I want to explain the correction. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm alone. I, I don't have an army of people. I'm typing shit out. I'm looking at my notes over the last three and a half years. We have witnesses that have seen it many for many, many, many years because this thing has been kind of been the ghost story, the spaghetti monster you know, at the base. So as I'm cumulatively going through everything, because it's not one source, it's not one time we were sent this video, you and me, or these videos. Um, so what, what's happened is, uh, I think I said it was 2018 on the YouTube release, like raw, what I meant is that's raw to us. Like that's how we received the footage, exactly like you're seeing on the screen, except for the title. But I said 2018, um, because some people saw it in 2018, some people saw it in 2019, 2021, 2022, but I think it was actually filmed in 2017. It was October, probably between the dates of the 17th and the 20th. Not sure. So I don't want to report for sure I know something. So that is my my flaw in that with all the sources we have, cumulatively, without editors and sleep deprived, yeah, I put an eight instead of a seven. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's correcting it is what journalists are supposed to do. You make a mistake on it, you correct it, and we've done that. So uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal. We now know for sure because of the reaction to the TMZ program and and uh, hopefully some of the, the interviews that you've done on other media, um, that there were other witnesses. We knew that before. Yeah. We had talked to a lot of witnesses, but now some of them have come forward uh, to buttress the, the legitimacy of the case we know also uh, about the platform. So we didn't say in that recording what the platform was, but it's an aerostat, right? 
Yeah, th- that's right. So now we can be really clear about it. So l- let's answer that. But let me go back to what you said. Why why isn't it balloons? So I, I, I don't know what it is, but we we now that the video is out without endangering, because we, we don't know who we can show this to initially. That's the problem. We can't just like throw it out to everybody and then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're revealing sources. So what we do know and what we knew before was that it was, it's not a smudge. I mean, there's a, a lot of reasons why it's not a smudge, but I love it. They say it's, it's first they say it's balloons. Then they say it's um, birds. And then they say it's bird shit. You know, Arnold, it's so funny to me the mental gymnastics that these, you know, straight up debunkers, you know, what, what they try to do. But so we, let's talk about that. So we know it's not a smudge on the lens because the infrared would look right through it when it's looking at a distance because of the field of view. Now I'm not an expert in this, but not only was that obvious to me, so it's disingenuous for people to say that, but it was obvious to me, but also there's a guy online and he did this kind of time lapse that you sent me, George, it was on Twitter. I think, again, I don't, like click on Twitter, except when you guys send me links and you can see it clearly rotating as a three-dimensional object. So that was cool. So that kind of immediately debunked the debunkers on their initial things. Now, you know, why isn't it balloons? This is important. Like I would be very surprised if it was balloons because these operators are highly trained. I've actually seen myself the the training slides and and the information that these guys go through to operate the aerostat, which is the question you had of the platform. So you're at this base in Iraq. It's a base within a base, and now it's publicly you know said. So I'm going to say it. You know, as a Habania Lake, it was right by the base is right by that lake. Um, what what we know is that they are trained, like literally. Here is a bunch of balloons. Here's what it looks like through the MX-20 camera off of the aerostat, right? And this is the Persistent Threat Detection Program, I think is the name of the aerostat. It's made by Lockheed Martin. And and there's a couple, I believe there's a couple cameras and seven, I I think seven sensors, sensor systems on this unit. And and so they're trained to, to know before they ever start operating the machinery, This is what balloons are like. This is what they look like. This is how you can get confused by balloons. This is what a plastic bag in the wind or debris looks like. I have seen the briefing materials. I have talked to numerous people that operate this system and all of them, all of them say, we are trained on that. This is not that. So from my understanding and a lot more information, yeah, that's that's pretty much why we know that this was designated UAP is because they excluded those very prosaic and simple answers to those questions of what what it's not. Um, I'm not sure how much we can share. I'll just proceed and you can tell me if it's going too far. We do know some other details that we had not made public. Some of them you've sort of alluded to in various media interviews, but we know that there was a team of other personnel, after this thing is seen on this aerostat, they can't lock onto it. It's not like a normal trash or balloon. They're having trouble. It looks like it might have been an active jamming program, which is a pretty significant difference between um, a, an unknown and a plastic bag or or a balloon. Um, yeah. Secondly, the, the thermal imaging. We'll get into talking about the thermal imaging. The signature seems to change a little bit. Thirdly, uh, not only could they not lock onto this thing, but they sent out this team I forget what the name of the team is, but there's like 10 personnel with night vision goggles looking up in the sky. They're told exactly where this thing is flighting over the base, but they can't see it. Night vision does not work. Balloon? Let's go into um, the the first thing you said. So so the active jamming. Let me me explain that to people. We don't know for sure. I am reporting to you and, and, and you, George, are reporting what it is that we have been told and what we've been able to verify. So I know for sure, 100%, and you and I have evidence of this, that the platform was fully uh, detailed the next day to try to figure out why it couldn't lock on the target. The target, everybody's trying to figure out the distance to it. it this aerostat, this weapons targeting platform 
can target and lock an Al-Qaeda tire on a vehicle at more than 23 miles away, and they can lock it, track it, and go. Never in history of this base and this platform, we are told, have, have, has it ever failed, ever. This and we're talking balloons. We're talking drones with like payloads. You know, like when we released the dome UAP over Syria, the whole thing we learned and told the public was CENTCOM, and everybody was like, "Dude, if anything's in proximity to ground troops or it looks like it can carry a payload, we shoot it down." So this happens all the time. People send in bombs and shit over, and even at this base, they've had issues like this. This was the first time that this weapons system targeting platform could not obtain a lock. So this already with the laser range finders and being able to do this, it was scrambled. It was scrambled. And so they they said that is jamming. And they also said, we believe that is active jamming, meaning the object itself, the jellyfish UAP was causing this. Now they don't know for sure. That's why they did the next day, the full breakdown of the system, making sure it worked and everything checked out. It worked. So the operators, and there's one to two at any given time, usually two on this object. And and I believe there's two feeds, by the way. Maybe that's why you see the difference of the green crosshairs and the yellow crosshairs on the second video. Uh, But they were unable to track it. They were unable. So they had to optically, manually slew, kind of exactly like who I just talked with today, um, Commander Chad Underwood. He said he had to manually slew, manually follow it because it was actively jamming his weapons tracking platform, his weapons designation platform. So it's the same thing here. We believe that it was active jamming because that's what's being told to us and the systems were checked. Now, the thermal imaging and the the, the night vision you mentioned. Thermal imaging. I am not an expert on thermal imaging. That's why I've been really like gentle with this. I don't know. And and I know for sure we can't tell. Does the object change hotter and colder? There, There are absolutely times in which the camera itself is looking at heat differential, right? So the difference between heats. So you can get like, you know, a hotter spot behind and something can look like it's changing. It doesn't exclude that the thing itself is changing hot to cold. We don't know. I'm not an expert at that, but it is very curious and very bizarre. And and now that it is out publicly, George, maybe a bunch of experts can tell us, is the object changing from hot to cold? But we we don't know. We never claim to know. It's just we know that it is showing a a temperature differential. So it's it's very interesting. And and, and then we're also told by some people directly that they think that the object itself is changing temperature. That's what yes. they think, they believe, and they are they are experts at this stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, but I'm just like, I, you know, I don't know personally, but yeah, we are told that for sure, a- a- and more, and more. And let's get into that a little bit more, because there's a lot of videos of this thing, you know, in classified systems that, that have been, I think, illegally kept by the bases, because it was all confiscated. We'll talk about that. But the last thing you said, and I want to address it, is the night vision. So you and I have very direct information of like exactly what happened and what went down on, on that night or the next morning on that base. And one thing you mentioned, George, is you were, you kind of revealed that, you know, there were people with night vision. Yeah. There was at least 10 people that were tasked from the um, combat information center. Maybe I think was the term to, they, they know exactly where it is because look, we didn't provide the HUD display, George. So the HUD display is this display that shows the exact trajectory, the speed, all this stuff. It got a little scrambled because it couldn't track it. But we know this thing was absolutely within close proximity viewing, viewing from where people were like, you can see in the video, people are like walking and they're like literally facing this thing. People were tasked, at least 10 people were tasked by the Combat Information Center to go out with their NVGs, their night vision goggles, which is an infrared, right, with amplification of light, to look at it. They said to us, it was invisible. Invisible, meaning they knew where it was. They bring up this other technology, not thermal, and you can't see it. That, if that is true, that is mind-boggling. Is that what you were talking about? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, this case stands out in so many ways. 
they had never really seen anything that looked quite like this. It's really weird. I mean, as we said in that original recording, it is the creepiest UFO video I've ever seen. I mean, I look forward to seeing it, but that thing is weird. There's a lot of speculation. Hey, was that a pilot? Was that an alien wearing a jetpack? Um, you know, wh what the heck was it? Was it a was it a robot, a flying robot of some sort? We don't know, but it really was creepy. They haven't seen it before. And it, how it was handled, you know, the 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 sensors being unable to pick it up, the night vision being able, unable to see it, and then how the whole case and the recordings were handled stands out. It's unique. It's unidentified. Well, let, let's paint, let's paint that picture. Let's see if I can hit like kind of all the points on that. Um, what did happen the next day? What is unique about this? And now I can openly talk about it because, you know, so much is out now, but so here's what really struck me other than the fact that it was already on our radar because of the footage from Pantex where a, an object that looks almost identical to this moves between nuclear silos and then shoots off instantaneous at a 45 degree angle, we'll, we'll get more into that. But what happened at this base in Iraq? What happened that night and the next day? Well, here's what was different. When, when anybody works in those kind of facilities, look, this is a secret facility within a facility. And I, I can't go much farther than that, but it was run by intelligence agencies, a part of the Navy, DOD, multiple countries. Here's what happened. The object comes on. Now, remember, they get, you know, drones with payloads to blow shit up, DJI drones all the time. When this came up, the, the live feeds were cut to the other countries in the joint operation base. They were cut. That is already unusual. Next thing that happens, after the technicians were told to follow it, track it, try to uh, keep recording, you know, when it went out over the water, went into the water... They were told to look at the area, and that's when they got the footage of it coming out of the water. Here's what happened. The, 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 I don't know, I'm going to use the wrong word, but like the base commander, like, you know, one of the top dogs, not only rolls up, but rolls up with two armed um, Marines that were uh, coming to confiscate the footage. And they confiscated the footage. Uh, they did not sign it out. This, this has never happened before. This has never happened before. They, they're, they're like, no, we're, we're not signing it out. This never happened. You may never talk about it. The next day, everybody involved, and even if they weren't involved, they were questioned, they had to sign specific NDAs for that event. Now, remember, they already signed NDAs just to be there. These are our top dog intelligence officers. So they cut off the feeds. They, they, they can't see it on night vision. They, they roll up with armed guards. They confiscate the footage, the original footage, they confiscate it, and then they have everybody sign NDAs for this singular event. Now, that has never happened for an incursion of just a payload and a drone. So already we're like, okay, this is crazy. This is totally different than anything that's happened before. How that footage survived, you and I have been trying to figure that out. How did that footage survive? Check this out. It's, it's a long set of footage. That's what people have to understand. It was over 20 minutes. It was filmed prior to it going into the water. Then it was 17 minutes it was in the water. And then it comes out, pauses, and then shoots off at an extraordinary rate of speed. I don't think it was an instantaneous movement, but it was so fast that when you see the footage, it's like the, the person's trying to, you know, kind of grab it because you're manually trying to get this right. You can't lock on it. So all of this said, what, how this footage survived is incredible to me. I mean, people knew it was important. They knew it was unusual. People that deal with this every day, they were trained to understand. So look, a lot of people inside of this base were told, don't ever talk about it. They signed NDAs. Somebody, if not somebody's, recorded in the in the command information center this footage or or maybe in the in the room with the, with the aerostat somehow this footage that was confiscated survived to the point where a lot of people ended up seeing it and it became the legend of the base spaghetti monster yeah yes i heard that a bunch i didn't want to say it because i wanted a few things to be held back to see if somebody actually knew about it because already we have um, intelligence agency assets, people coming at us pretending 
that they have been there and seen it just to try to get information. So, so keeping words like that for you and me are really good because then we'll know, oh, they were probably there, you know? Well, among the things we got beat up about this week, A, it's a smudge, B, it's balloons, C, it's bird poop, uh, D, it's uh, two different objects 12 miles apart, somebody said. It's just, you know, we, we got pummeled on pretty much every level you can imagine. But in addition to that, we don't show video of the object stopping over the lake, going into the water, and shooting out. Now, how, how could we possibly explain that? Would we like to share that information? I, I would, where is it? You know, where is it? Would, would love to share that. So, so here's the deal. Um, yeah, this is going to be hard, I think, for, for, for people to, to really understand the position that, that we're in. Um, Obviously, it's a filming of, of a screen. So, so people share this. M remember this new kid that came out? You know, he's like, I never thought I would ever see this in public realm. Nobody believed me. So apparently, there are broken up multiple files that were somehow collected before it was all confiscated. And I think it's three or more files where this stuff is inside of, of a classified server on a classified last laptop in a classified base within a classified base. I mean, it's like crazy to me. So I would assume that whoever recorded this was doing so at their own peril in that it's illegal to do that, like highly. So I, I would assume that an individual or individuals that, that kind of captured this were were kind of like, uh, in a rush to get whatever they could. Because remember, a lot of people could be at base and they could be shown the first video, but they can't read the reports and they can't see the additional videos. And we know a lot of people, George, have seen just the first video, which is much, much higher quality, obviously, than what we're putting out, which is a screen on a screen. Right. So I would, to answer your question, why don't we have that footage and why don't we put it out to the public? The, the answer to that question is, it's a miracle a miracle that, that people get to see this amount of the footage, two videos of the same object over the same base an incursion over a conflict zone. First time in history, we've heard about it, you know, with those shutdowns and nukes and stuff. First time we ever get to see it. It's a miracle. We even got this much, but what we can do, George, you and I can identify very specifically where that footage was taken, what that footage is of, and we can go sit down in a skiff and we can inform the Senate Intelligence Committee or anybody that wants to know, the new head of Arrow, exactly how to find this footage with witnesses. And I think you and I should do that. Well, yeah. I mean, people get mad at us because we don't show the, the, uh, the, the glory shot. Um, and the question is, who has it? Where is it? Why hasn't the public seen it? This is supposedly the age of transparency from our, our Pentagon and the U.S. government. Where is that video? We know it exists. We know people who've seen it. Uh, so where is it? Secondly, where's the report? There is a very detailed report that we've yes. been told about by multiple persons that lists the whole history of this incident and, and why it stands out, why it's a genuine UAP. Where's that report? Did Arrow get it? Can Congress yeah. get it? No, nobody's got it. Don't be mad at us because the government's hiding this stuff. We're telling you it exists. Go find it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, look, man, we're, we're, we're doing the best we have with the best we got. Like we're taking personal risk and also trying to protect sources and everything and also national security. We're, we're trying to protect national security by not, you know, just uh, exposing everything. Like we're doing our best with the best we have. But George, we, we, we will do this. We will make sure that that trail is hunted down and we'll do it in the appropriate way without harming national security. And we will bring witnesses in. We will help bring witnesses in to testify behind scenes about this, if not publicly. Look, can we talk about real quick the fact that there's at least three videos of this and what they show? Because I, we kind of briefly showed a video when we on the TMZ special and it was kind of confusing for people uh, about it being over the water, not over the water, what's going on. Can I explain that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we we gave you kind of what came to us in kind of you know a raw form like that. That's how it came to us. Um, 
there are three parts to this video that apparently were somehow maintained, you know, before it was uh, taken off or somehow, because people can film the screens like as it's happening, I think. So the, the second video, it, it didn't show much. It wasn't as detailed. So I just didn't think it was that important. But I believe that video, because it has different color crosshairs, like I think it's like yellow instead of green. I believe that each operator gets to designate the color of, of the crosshairs and the information that they want. And I know, I, I believe there are two cameras that are that are going on. So I believe what we are seeing, uh, I am told, is the same object. Um, I think it's just after it was close in the base. I think it was first noticed, unfortunately, when it was close in the base. I think the second video is right after when it when it's moving kind of farther away, there's a third video where it's seen over the water, and then it does these maneuvers. It, it does this. I mean, that's the money shot. Like I wish we had it. That's the curse of the UFO world. Like I wish we had it. But like beggars can't be choosers. Like we got what we got, but we know where it is. We know who to tell, and people have seen it, and we have talked with them, and they've gone on record with us telling us what they saw. So that's what I know about the videos is that it was broken up into parts and it's been passed around, but that CD with everything, we know where that is. You know, I, I so many funny uh, descriptions of what this is. You know, it's a smudge, it's a balloons, it's a two objects separated by 12 miles, it's bird poop, uh, hilarious reaches uh, by a lot of people. I, I think a witch on a broom, maybe, uh, Elliot and E.T. riding their bicycle, uh, you know, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised by anything that comes out. We'd love to be able to release that other video. We're trying to tell you it exists. Yeah. Uh, don't be mad at us because the Pentagon won't make it public or acknowledge it. Go get it. You know, it's, um, we don't have a magic formula. There's no right. secret, um, uh, golden ticket that we have to go get this stuff. You want to sit at home and gripe on Twitter. Gosh, I've been sitting here for three hours. I don't have any definitive ufo evidence of aliens landing why haven't i had it yet well go get some go get it yeah yeah i mean look we're doing the best we can and uh you know we're and also with national security in mind not putting out stuff that uh would harm national security so look i, I think we can get a few answers here because i think this is uh it's kind of exciting to me again i might mess up the acronyms i maybe it's the command operations center or the command information center i don't remember what they call it but uh you know they had big screens during this event, that those videos were being pumped in, and everybody in, I, and we can ask who we're about to talk with. I think they called it the Command Operations Center or the or the Command Information Center. Don't know, but it was on big screens, so all of a sudden, like people could film it there and see. But remember, this was the persistent threat detection system, the Aerostat, that it was all filmed on. But I, I think, without further ado, something happened this week, George, and it was interesting. Kind of like you and I hope, which is that more people would come forward. And even if it's limited, even if it's like secondhand, that they would tell what they know, their specific little section. And super interesting is that uh, there's a gentleman that did come forward. And actually, I missed a bunch of messages from this person because I don't see my social media. Um, Michael Sinkowski, and, and he is a secondhand witness to that. He was at the base. After, it's a rotation that came in and 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 allowed, you know, kind of took over after um, the rotation before. And he actually saw a part of the footage. He saw one of the videos, from what I understand. And unfortunately, I think he was very misquoted. Which to you and me, George, with New York Post, we know that not only do they twist things and look, you know, for debunking angles, but they actually like lie. They, they end up misquoting people intentionally, but I can only imagine what it's like. You see this thing for the first time. You don't expect it to be out in the world. You see it and you're like, that's what I've been talking about. And then you get descended upon by people with agendas other than just reporting the news. And I think that that's what happened to Michael Sinkowski, who is, from what I know from my brief conversations with him, he's a stand-up dude. Look, he's just a dude that was there, but what he can do is he can validate that this is military film footage at that base, that it was an actual event, that it's an unknown, and that he was witness to some of the footage, or at least a portion of the footage. So, so unless you have something to say, George, without further ado, 
Let's bring in this dude who I'm excited to talk with, Michael Sinkas. The following is an exclusive interview with Marine veteran Michael Sinkoski. Michael, thanks so much for joining Weaponize, man. I, I saw that you are a like secondhand witness to what it is we talked about. You you never thought this footage would would come out. We talked before. Got a, a few questions for you. This is George Knapp, uh, co-host of Weaponized, investigative Mike. reporter. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Mike, um, I, I'd like to start with this. Um, this is your baptism of fire, your first entry into UFO world. What's it been like and what's your first overall impressions? It's been a little overwhelming. I didn't really expect any of this. Um, I never expected to see this footage ever again, ever since uh, after leaving Iraq. I thought that was the last time I was going to see those videos. I've told a few people about what I'd seen over there since I've been back, but I never had the video footage to back it up. So when uh, a few of my buddies sent me the video that's been circling around, I'm like, that's it. You know, that's what I remember seeing. And I jumped into the comment section, I think, of one of the videos because I think there were a few claims that I don't remember seeing on the original video. So I was just trying to clarify all of that. And then all of a sudden, I started getting a bunch of attention and people wanted to ask me all these questions. And uh, I don't know, three or four days later, here I am. It's been, uh, it's been kind of exciting. And I'm just trying to, um, I've been trying to stay away from it um, because I want to approach this um, as objectively as possible. I'm not here to confirm anyone's biases or anything like that. I just want to share what I saw. Well, that's good. I mean, I know that the, I think the first interview that most people saw was conducted by the New York Post. And we saw that and we were kind of surprised by the angle that was taken. Can you walk us through that, what you said, and then what, what versus what was reported? So the, the biggest thing I think that was um, kind of maybe twisted from my mouth is I, I really wanted to take the approach of I'm, I'm kind of 50 50 between, you know, this there, there could be a logical explanation behind what this thing could be. But I, I am very open to the idea of it being something a, a little more exciting. Um, but I, I was kind of forced to take a position and I didn't want to. And that was kind of illustrated. And I'm trying to, you know, make it known that it. I don't have the authority or the information to tell anybody that, you know, what this thing really is. All, all I know is I've seen a longer form video of, of this thing and we, we had our theories, but there was never enough information to fully explain it. Well, what do you mean you, you were forced to take a position? You told me that first thing you, and we recorded that conversation. I asked you, can I record? And you, you said that you were being kind of forced into position, you know, of like a debunk kind of thing. I think it was the New York Post. You said, what was the, what was the misquote? What was the kind of pressure you were put under to, to, to take a position? I think specifically, um, yeah, it was that New York Post. He had asked me, he was like, do you think it's alien or do you think it's more prosaic? And I, I with the information that I have and being with my background, being an intelligence analyst, right? I, with, with all that information that I have, I went with, I'm leaning more towards, it's a more pro prosaic phenomenon. It's, it could be probably logically explained, but that is not my official position. Like I, I am still open to the, you know, if any new information can come out, if anybody else can come forward that has maybe a bigger piece of the puzzle that I have and can, you know, maybe shift my, uh, position, maybe up more the other way. I'm totally open to that. I just don't want to take a whole mind stance. You know, I, I want to talk with you about just the facts, what it is you saw, what it is you know. But I guess my my, my question is, uh, you, you kind of conveyed to me, were you pressured by the New York Post to like be, were they trying to get you just to debunk it right out the gate? I think they wanted me to. Uh, I didn't, I didn't feel pressured during the interview, uh, it was more of a, just kind of a, more of a friendly question. Like, Oh, what do you think? And I was like, well, I kind of think this, but afterwards when, uh, it was written about and shared to an audience, it, it made it sound more so that that is my position and it, that's not <laughs> necessarily true. Welcome to the world of, of UFOs. You, you have bad actors, disingenuous brokers of information. You have people that their job, their self-proclaimed job, you know, what they're trying to do is twist people's words like yours and, and make it fit into their mold. And I'm sorry you had that experience, 
Um, but now that we've talked, let's just go through the facts. You know, I, I think you did a check and you found out that there's more footage from that event that you were unable to see. Is that factually correct? So I, I did check and it was confirmed to me that there are multiple recordings of various lengths. I, when I initially remembered the, uh, seeing the footage, uh, it, it was six years ago. So I recalled about 17 minutes worth of footage that we had. And I was thinking that's just one video, but talking to, uh, the, uh, the source that was out there with me, uh, on the team, uh, they had mentioned that there was multiple recordings and that made me remember like, oh yeah, that's right. I remember having, I think it's either two or three different recordings of, of this thing. It's three. Three. Yeah. Okay. I was leaning more towards well, three. Well, so it was one. Yeah, no, well, it was, it was one recording, but by the way, there, there may have been multiple cameras, um, on that aerostat. I'm not exactly sure, but I know for sure that the length of the, I know for sure that the length of the video was about like 30 minutes before it went um, into the water, which is another piece of footage. And they broke it up. I mean, look, just to even this, this footage was confiscated immediately that night. And so the fact people, you know, were able to record some of it onto their secret computers or whatever you call them is astounding to me because I know that it was confiscated footage. So from what I understand in that file system, there's not only multiple videos, but there's also like a full report of what happened that night. You might not have had access to, to that report. Um, maybe people who are just in command of, of the shifts, you know, do, but can you, I guess, first thing, can you just tell us like, what was your job out there? What was your specific job? Just so people understand who we're talking with. Specifically in Iraq, I was an ITC, which stands for ISR Tactical Controller. ISR being Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. And essentially what that is, is what you'd think of maybe an air traffic controller, but for intelligence unmanned drones, um, kind of mixed with maybe a mission controller. So I was kind of like the liaison between unmanned assets that were that we had available to us in within the, the theater of operations. And I would tell these drones where to go, what to look at, and kind of what their missions were. So that's that's primarily what I did. And secondarily to that, I also uh, was the counter UA UAS Marine. And so we would monitor um, the our adversaries would once in a while fly these quadcopters against us. And uh, they have been known. It didn't happen to us on our base while I was there or that I heard of previously. But uh, they would fly these quadcopters over these drones or, or over the over the base and collect information, maybe drop grenades. And uh, so that was a real threat. And so the, I, part of my job was to make sure that we can detect these things and stop that from happening. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason why George and I knew by, by seeing you come out that you had been there is because we, we kept back from the public some details and you provided those details. So we're like, that guy was there, the spaghetti monster, that, that term people used. Like we kind of held that back to see if people would say that to see if they were actually there. And then also the fact that you uh, were aware that it was filmed on the persistent threat detection um, system, the Aerostat, which is actually a Lockheed Martin build. We knew you were legit the second that, that we heard those details and you could name the base, you knew the Lake Havania, all that stuff. Um, but just to be clear, you, did you ever actually uh, utilize the persistent threat uh, detection system, the aerostat, or, or your job was more like incursions uh, of hostile drones. Which which one? Uh, more so on the uh, UAS side. So uh, using uh, unmanned drones, uh, we we did have the PTIDs there, the aerostat, as an asset for intelligence con collection if we needed it. I never had to use it in that capacity. Uh, so I don't really have any experience specifically with that. And secondary to my primary duties was the counter U.S. side of it. Uh, Michael, we know for sure there is a big report that lists this, according to our military, our government, as unidentified, anomalous, weird. Uh, we know for sure there's a, another video that the public has not yet seen of this thing going in and out of the water because we've spoken to multiple witnesses. 
Can you share with us, based on your expertise and your career over there, why this incident stands out? What's strange about it? What jumps out at you, the, the facts that you know? What's strange about it is that no other systems or that I'm aware of uh, sensors picked it up, that it seemingly was over our base. And the only way that we were able to see it was just with one of our, um, our thermal cameras. And it was just an unknown because, you know, we have to watch something like, like that to make sure it's not a threat. And it was just, just the shape of it was something that I've never seen before. Um, in all my time of looking at drone footage, watching live feeds and, and things like that, the, it was just. Yeah, it was unexplainable. It's creepy, isn't it? Yeah, I remember watching it for the first time, and I, I worked the night shift, so like walking around outside at that night, there's been a few times where it's been in the, in the back of my head. Like, what if I just look up and there's an eight foot spaghetti monster over my overhead? <laughs> Wouldn't that be scary? <laughs> Now that you've seen sort of the, the video again and refreshing your memory, I, this wasn't a Jedi mind trick by Jeremy where he planted this in your head, right? He didn't get you to change your story? No, not at all. I, he, uh, a after talking with them, I was able to critically think a little bit more back because like I said, it's been six years since I've seen this video. So as I'm thinking back and as I'm talking to other people who were there with me, uh, some of the, you know, the fuzzy details are starting to become a little bit more clear. And so, yeah, nothing was planted in my head by any means. You, you were, you know, I understand, like, you got thrown into the fire. You know, this was long ago. Look, I dealt with this with Commander Fravor in 2004, with the Tic Tac UFO. Like, you know, th there's people that just want to twist your words and, and try to get you in a gotcha moment that you've contradicted yourself. Um, I appreciate you, you know, enduring that. And, and, and also reaching back out to people that you knew there to, like, validate and verify your memory you know, how many videos were there? What did we see? Um, you know, I, I think that's important that that you you do that and not get wrapped up in everything. And ultimately, look, man, a lot of people saw this footage. George and I have known that in a very small community, though. So just the fact you're willing to come forward, probably exciting for you. You're like, I've told people about this, but they didn't believe me. And then all of a sudden you look on the news and there's the footage. So I get that. But yeah, the first time we talked, I mean, you know, comparing notes, it just concerned me when you said that you were misquoted and that you, from the very beginning, you felt like they were just trying to get you to like, you know, um, take an agenda or take a, a, a take on it, like a, to debunk it. So I, I understand that you, you don't know the world we live in where people are disingenuous brokers of information. So let's just stick with the facts. So you saw what you now know is a part of longer footage and you confirmed that with somebody who was at base that there's more footage you didn't see. Is, is that correct? I confirmed that it is possible that there is more footage that I didn't see. Um, as far as there actually being more out there that uh, that specifically that I, that I didn't see, I, I don't know for sure. Um, all I know is I, right. I, I believe it was about three recordings that I had saved um, on, on my workstation, on, on the server there, that uh, and it was about 17 minutes in length that uh, that was of this object, and, and that's all I know. Yeah. So, so look, we're comparing notes right now. So, yeah, yeah. from the direct information George Knapp and I, you know, have on this, and also what we've seen, the assets we've seen, it's my understanding that it was first picked up on like really close, like the close footage was actually the first video, and they see it. And and then they they basically target. I think there's two cameras on the thing. Uh, that that's a whole nother story we're looking into and trying to get information on. But that it was followed for more than 20 minutes before it went into the water. That's what we're told. That's what we understand, and that's what we have some evidence of. And so th I know that the the core of the footage was on a CD. It was actually on a CD, and that CD was was taken that night under um, with military guard. So, and all of that is in the intelligence report, which I believe you never had access to, right? Like the full report of what happened that night. Did you read that in the classified server? No, I did not. Okay. 
So that would be so cool to, 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 I mean, we have to be careful with national security, but it'd be really cool to get that out because it's a very detailed report. So I, I guess that where you were being most misconstrued was when, you know, when you said like it didn't go into the water, what you, what I believe I understand is that you never saw that footage of it going right. into the water. Right. Okay. So yeah. let me ask you this. Um, how would you characterize the reaction from the command uh, folks at the base? Um, was that unusual, how this case was handled, based on what you've reconstructed, talking to colleagues who were there at the time that it happened? They didn't really uh, mention anything about the, uh, the reaction from the command or the higher-ups or anything like that. Um, when I was shown the video, it was more of just a you know cool thing video that's saved on the system, you know, something that happened months ago. They did really brief me on, you know, having to worry about this thing coming back or, you know, having to take, you know, certain per, uh, measures to ensure nothing like this happens again. It was just, you know, something that was unexplainable. It happened and then that's it. Yeah, I think so. If I understand when you inherited your position, you said this was kind of like the ghost story of the base. So you were you were told about it. And then on that classified, you know, computer, you were able to like see some of it, but you but you didn't have access to like the first hand direct witness report of what happened that night, nor were you there the first time. So you didn't get to get fully filled in on that. So you're kind of what you're doing is you're seeing the footage, you're talking with people at the base, and they've said, look, this was at least unique enough that somebody captured it, kept it. And spread the word as something that's weird, right? Right. Interesting. So, so what do you, from your expertise, because specifically what you can talk about, other than the fact you saw it, I'm really appreciative and excited that 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 you that you are public about this. But your job, what you did, can you just talk about like why this is important? Incursions over the base, like bringing in bombs, I and mean, this is something that happens all the time. We know about this where people would just strap right to the base of DJI drones, you know, bombs and try to fly them in the base. I mean, this is of real concern. I mean, that right at bases like you were at. Yeah. I, uh, I spent probably a good portion of my pre-deployment training, uh, even traveling around, uh, across the United States and, you know, helping develop, uh, systems that can counteract these, these drones from, flying overhead of the bases and, and so we could stop that threat it, it was becoming to be a serious threat and then we were becoming to we were starting to take it very seriously so are you an expert in identification of things through FLIR like I, I don't know I literally don't know are you an expert on identification of things through FLIR forward looking infrared on this platform uh PTIDs specifically yeah or say... just FLIR in general we had a, a separate contracted um, entity uh, of personnel that that were the experts, that were imagery experts that that could identify, you know, things like uniforms and specific vehicles and specific weapon systems. So I would I wouldn't say that I'm I'm an expert in that realm. I've just seen I'll, enough footage to be able to tell what you know a lot of the things were. So with, with that, so I understand there's parameters to your expertise, but with that said, you, you've seen a lot of shit. You've seen a lot of drones right. with bombs on them. Um, does this have the same morphology? Does, is this consistent with anything you've ever seen before? No, I've never seen anything like this before. It's a head scratcher. It is. One other question, Michael, uh, you, you know, we, it, you've seen the video again now. Uh, it, it appears that the thermal temperature uh, of this object changes from black to white, from hot to cold. Uh, and sometimes it looks like the background might also be changing. Do you have any theories on or, or ideas about whether that's the object that's changing or the background or both? I think that's more of a, a sensor thing, uh, the sensor kind of um kind of like an autofocus on, on a camera, right? I, I think it's it's more um, trying to tune into the best um, settings to get the best visual. I, I don't I don't think it's the object itself shifting in, in, um, in temperature at all. I, I could be wrong, but that, that's just my opinion. 
Yeah, let me um I so now that George and I could put this out because we have to our job as journalists is to protect sources even if they don't protect themselves. So you, it's like not like you can like broadcast this to a bunch of like intelligence individuals and say, "Hey, what do you think?" You got to protect people because obviously somebody leaked this, right? Um what we've found out and we'll see if it's true, but what what we've found out operators on that day, the only thing that they really change is white hot or black hot. So this artifact idea, it, it's not something that's manually being done. The, the footage itself, it's showing a differential in heat. So you can definitely get like a, a false positive that something is going like hot and cold, hot and cold, if it's going over in the differential in the camera, but it's not a manual thing. They were telling us that what they can do is go to white hot, black hot. Uh, the system itself might be adjusting totally. It doesn't discount that the object itself is going cold or hot. We don't know. And not even the experts I've talked to really know. Does that does that track with, with how you understand it as well? That it's not like something manually they're adjusting, white, hot, cold, black, hot. It's that they're, it's showing a differential in heat compared to the environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um and as far as I know, I didn't have hands on. I wasn't controlling any of these assets. There's usually a, uh, an operator yeah. that I would work through um, and, and they would be the one that would do that if if at all, if it was an automatic thing or that, that they would manually adjust that. So that that would be something I, yeah. I can't speak to myself, but it, it would make sense to me that, you know, it is possible no. that, that that object is. is I, 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 yeah, it is possible. But, I, you know, we don't know. I, I appreciate that because, you know, we're all trying to figure this out now that we can put this out obviously much bigger, we'll get some great intel on this. This has always confused me and George and the few people we've been able to kind of share this with is what exactly is going on. Can we identify the object itself? Because the other thing was it, it, they were unable to track. It's the only time in their history they were. Did you hear about that, that they did a full systems check on the camera system after because they were baffled by how they weren't able to lock it? I think I was told that the, the P-TIDs eventually came down and was serviced and was clean pretty much right after the event. And that's just something that I heard in passing because it was like, oh, it's a weird thing that we caught in camera. We're going to make sure our systems are, are good. So, yeah, that, yeah. that tracks. Yeah. So, so, Michael, just if you want to give a last statement of like kind of what it is you're trying to say, like why you decided to go on YouTube and type that in and like um, just kind of like what you're w without being filtered or twisted by journalists, you know, in, in on Twitter like, what is it you want people to know? What are you saying? The biggest thing I want people to know is I don't have all the information. I, I maybe have a bigger piece of the puzzle that, than most people do. And, you know, that, that piece is something that I've seen six years ago. And so, yeah, my memories are, are a little fuzzy and I'm trying to recall everything about it, you know, that I can and, and bring forward this information to the best of my ability. I'm not trying to, to confirm anybody's biases about trying to further anybody's agendas i only have a few bits of information that i think are you know maybe helpful in this case i'm not the go-to expert by any means on probably any of this but all i can do is, is share my uh, my experience and what i saw and that's that's what i'm doing H healthy attitude my brother and um don't worry there will be uh people coming forward with you know much more detailed knowledge of this event but i really thank you like you know for putting your neck out there because you know you're going to be barraged by shit but i think if you just stay true to yourself and to like the facts of it and you know call people out when they misquote yeah or, or twist your story because that's important for the public to see you know i think if you got your head on straight and you just you know talk about what you know great please don't hold it against us for what ufo world has has done to you and we hope you'll stick around the topic because uh, your voice is, is important. It's a welcome addition to this community. So that was cool that he stepped forward. I'm sorry he got a bad impression of our, our topic and our general UFO world community, but uh, that comes with the territory. It does. Yeah, I, I'm, I feel for the kid, you know, because he's kind of fresh into this thing and he had kind of got a bad taste in his mouth at the beginning. And private conversations. I understand that. But, you know, his testimony is important because what it did was it, it confirmed, well, first of all, the basic facts, George, 
that, that you and I are not lying. This is not CGI or something we made, that this was you know, military film footage of an unidentified, a, a UAP, a UFO, an incursion in a military base, that, that, that a footage of it. I mean, that's the first time in a conflict zone we've ever seen this. I mean, that is neat that he could confirm those details. I, I feel bad for him because I know he, he knows he only has a small piece of the puzzle, but I think to, to the greater public, it, it's a big deal. And although this was the only time this type of, of object was seen at that base, we touched on a little bit in our previous recording that was just included in this program that there have been other incident, incidents involving something that looked very similar. We've seen it all over Twitter or X this week. People found bits and pieces of video and images from around the world over decades where jellyfish type operations or uh, objects have been seen. And um, we know about Pantex, right? We, we didn't really get into details on that, but we know a lot more about it. Yeah, well, what I meant is this is the first time in a conflict zone that the world publicly gets exposed to footage of an incursion that, that has never happened before in history. So it's, it's like, it's cool for people to see that. But yeah, incursions happen all the time. We've heard about them. You've reported on them. You brought back documents from Russia explaining they've turned on and off nuclear weapons. But Pantex is why you and I originally took this pretty seriously. We're like, let's look at this because as, as our friend, uh, representative Burchett says, dad, gamut, dad, we've gamut, seen, dad, gamut. We've, we've seen this before. I mean, it's like, so what happened was, I, I, I we will not go into too much detail right now. But a Pantax, which is a nuclear facility, super sensitive, they arm and disarm nuclear weapons. You and I have received information, I will say, of an incursion by something that looks almost identical to this quote unquote jellyfish UAP. And it moves between nuclear silos. I think it's three and four. I need to look that up. But it moves between them through this like little gated area with little towers, which by the way, don't actually have humans in them anymore. They just have like robotic sensors and it, it goes through at a steady space, a pace and then goes up and then instantly moves off. That footage also exists. And now of course we would go right to jail if we release that. You can't release footage from inside of Fantex, but it's like people have that. We know where to task the Senate Intelligence Committee and whoever has access to go look for that that event did happen. It's a very similar morphology, not the exact same object, obviously. This was years before, but very similar morphology. So you and I took it very seriously, as well as what you brought back from Russia and also what we just know historically with incursions. So it's it's super interesting. Uh, jellyfish was not the only image that was released in the past week. We've been uh, We've been working with the chandelier, what you call the chandelier. For a while now, and that got uncorked as well. What's the reception been there? Not pretty negative again. Um, not really? not quite as pronounced as uh, jellyfish, but yeah, it's diffraction is what everyone said. It's a mess. All <laughs> it's diffraction. Oh my god, people are idiots. I'm sorry. Uh, so so that's cool. So in the in the two V special, in episode three, we start off with this conversation I'm having. And that is the individual's voice. It's not distorted. It's not changed. That's the individual's voice. It's not, you know, I heard somebody told me there were some conspiracies of who it was I was talking with. Um, look, nobody I talk with on the phone with it would have ever leaked information to you and me. I'm not an idiot, right? But that, but that individual you hear from is somebody that I can call and, and you and I can, can learn information from. Like, you know, is this legitimate? Should we pursue it? Is this something in, in the classified servers? designated UAP. It's, it's just a way for us to check. But in the show, we talk about the Chandelier UAP, totally different UFO or UAP incident. And it was over the Persian Gulf. I give the exact coordinates. We had, we had, George, you and I had to decide, do we give the coordinates or do we give the exact specific day and time? And you, you can't give both because if you give both, you could unknowingly be compromising national security. So because the coordinates were on the image, then it's like, okay, we go with the coordinates then. So the, we give the coordinates. What you see looks like a compass rose, it, it, which Como said on the news, which is interesting. It looks like a compass rose, but but it is actually, the, it's from a video. 
So it's a still image that you can see on the Tubi Special Part 3 of a video that is classified in UAP inside of the, the secure secret servers. It has been hotly debated within the intelligence community because they know it's not ours. They know it's not Russia. They know it's not China. Whose is it? But again, it's from a video. So we released a still because, again, we like our freedom. We don't want to go to jail. We don't know if we're compromising national security by releasing more. It is something that can be followed up on. But I will tell you this. The video is fascinating because it doesn't move the way you would expect. There's no flight control surfaces. It, it's, it moves in a strange pattern. And th there's, there's, there are really interesting elements to that video. Look, if people want to release the video anonymously out to the world, they should do that. They don't got to go through me. They don't got to go through you. But this image of the chandelier, and I didn't make that up, that's what's in the intelligence agency's files. That's what they call it. Because they said it's like if you're laying on your back, you look up at a chandelier, that's what it looks like. So yeah, you and I released that in, in the series in episode three. It is a completely separate UFO case and people should look into it. And maybe let, let's put up that image so, so Michael, if you could put up that image, it, it's fascinating in that it's in thermal as well. You see this kind of star or compass rose pattern of light. It, it's, it's not like glare or diffraction or whatever these words people are using. You know, look, if you end up seeing the video, I hope you do. You can see that this is hotly debated within the, the intelligence community and it is within a classified server of a whole bunch of unknowns, unidentifieds, and UAPs. I'm glad we could get this one out, George. I know you like the look of it. It's an interesting one, right? Very artistic. Um, the, <laughs> week, the week ended on sort of a high note in Washington. So Congress, members of Congress, Tim Burgett, Luna, a few others, have been antsy about hearing from the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community, the IGIC. Uh, specifically regarding David Grush and the amazing revelations that he delivered to the world back in July in an open hearing. Um, they've been waiting to hear if the ICIG stands behind what Grush said. They had a briefing. It's classified. There's only a limited amount of stuff they can say about what they heard, but they gave some pretty good indications that th what they heard buttressed the allegations leveled by David Grush about reverse engineering programs, possibly, about crash retrievals, we don't exactly know, do we? We know some of it. No, we do know some of it. People hate that you and I got eyes and ears everywhere. And in fact, like intelligence agencies know that. So they're like, you know, careful with the fact that we do know what happens, what goes down. And it is reported to us that inside of that room, first of all, there was about 15 people across the aisle. It was bipartisan. And a lot of people actually spoke with all the lawyers that were there that were like dealing with this, or at least the lawyer that was there. You know, they were, they were able to do a few things. One of the things they were able to do was verify that David Grush not just is who he says he is, but that his public claims about UAP were verified to a degree. They were auth authenticated that, that none of it so far that we know that he said was incorrect, was a lie, was infactual. So I, I really delineated that when I was kind of getting the news of what's going on inside. You know, I, I was like, was it just David Grush that is verified and validated? Or was it what he said publicly? And the answer was what he said publicly. And that's pretty huge. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the jellyfish UAP was on, uh, how do you say, front of mind with some of this. But the main thing is, is they were able to get briefed on stuff that was being held back from the ICIG. And I put out a little thread on the Como uh, news segment, which is that I know for sure, George, you and I know for sure, that some of the information that went to ICIG is because we told people to file those ICIG complaints. They were like, should we go to Arrow? Should we go directly to ICIG? I was like, go to Chuck McCullough, former ICIG, because... Man, that's a protected process. So we kind of knew what the ICIG was exposed to. And if there were lies being told again to Congress, I was going to raise hell. But from what I heard, you know, they got a pretty, pretty straight briefing uh, to the degree they could be briefed.
you know, Tim Burchett, Dad Gummit, he says uh, he's disappointed. He's, of course, he he wants it all. He wants it now. He gave it a four on a scale of ten. Not out of character for him. The other members of Congress who made statements afterward, I watched them. It was sort of like to to use the cliche deer in a headlights look. Even though they have been demanding this information, even though they think that David Grush and his allegations are credible, they seemed a little bit stunned uh, and shocked that that the ICIG would go ahead and um, a- and verify some of at least some of what Grush had been alleging. Uh, it it was like shocking to to them as that's the look i saw on their face yeah and I, and i after speaking uh with some individuals with you know information on this uh i could say that the takeaway was that we are having more public briefings and in fact i was on some news show and they surprised me is it representative ogles is that how you say his name yeah yeah he showed up and i straight up took the opportunity and i asked him I was like, are we going to have more briefings? Let me tell you, everybody that that you and I have talked with now on this, we are having more UFO, UAP briefings. This has stoked the fire. This has lit the fuse. Everybody is in agreement, bipartisan, across the aisle. We're having more briefings. And in fact, I've already been, you know, talking with people about, you know, who to include in these briefings. So that was really cool. Look, man, I, I think it was a huge step forward. It's it's not what everybody wants, but you saw some transparency in that meeting. From what I understand, they were stunned. They were shocked. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, as you know better than anybody, George. Like our Congress has been lied to and you have given briefings. You have given information in in in, I'd say, a classified setting. You have given information in a classified setting to try to move this ball forward. And I would like to say that the ball is being moved forward. And I'm very optimistic. Do you like optimism? Are you with me, George? You know where I am on that. Uh, I hate to be optimistic, but I would say that 2024 has started off on a pretty good note on the UFO topic and UAP transparency. I'd, I'd just like in closing to point out, you and I do not claim that any of these images, jellyfish, chandelier, pyramids, any of those are alien craft. We do not say they are non-human craft. We don't know what they are. They are unknown. They are unidentified. That is not our designation. The ones that we've been reporting on weaponized, the designation is made by our military, by our government. They are the ones that call these things unidentified. They look at all the available evidence, much more than we can see. That's their conclusion. We don't know what these things are. We don't know what the jellyfish was. We don't know what the chandelier is. That's them making that determination, not you and me. That's right. And I think we're all in the same boat. So thank you for kind of stating the obvious to me, but for other people, I think that that's really important. But I think we're all in the same boat. That's what it it tells me is like a lot of the people coming forward to, to you and to me, it's because they're frustrated because they know maybe they've been in a program about non-human intelligence and they see these assets and they think the world should have them. Look, the world should have the extra four minutes that is filmed of the gimbal UFO uh, encounter. The world should have that. The world should have the video footage from the Mosul orb. The world should have the extended footage of the jellyfish UAP. The world should have the footage of the chandelier UAP. You and I are just doing our best to get it out and try to help stoke the conversation so people understand that's at least my my purpose with this yeah well people sitting at home or frustrated by lack of progress get off your butts go get it there's no magic formula about it if you want it go work at it and go get it develop your own sources make contacts with congress um find locate military witnesses who have seen these things up close and personal and, and go after it you know, and then send it to us. We'll put it out. George, what are we going to do? Is this the end of season one of Weaponized? Is this the final episode? I thought maybe we got one more. What's going on, man? Where can I get you? I don't know. I'm I'm on the road, you know, so I'm not sure this is that we're ever going to have another episode. This might be it. No, no, dude. <laughs> we have to do a final episode, man. So this is real. Like, I'm not just joking for the audience here. George. We need to set a date to get a final episode, kind of like a a back look of what we've talked about in the last year 
and then a forward look to where we are. And look, this is just season one. I think you and I are going to want to do a season two, but we need to finish this season. Now, I have some guests that I would love to have on for the final episode of Weaponized. We might have a bonus episode here or there, but for the final one, there, there, there's a couple guests, one in particular I'd really love to have on, but we can't promise anything. So everybody's going to have to be patient, see where we go, because I can't get George Knapp into a point in time and space to confirm the last filming yet. Well, there's some secret stuff underway uh, that's taken a lot of my time, but the world will learn about it soon enough. And I know what guest you have in mind, and we'll see what we can do to work that out in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Later, Jeremy. Later, man. Never have so few had so much to tell, but could say so little. Follow and listen to Weaponized, a presentation of Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, Dark Horse Entertainment, and Cadence 13 Studios. Available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.